Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our look at the book of Genesis in a sermon series I've entitled The Gospel in Genesis. We're in chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verse 8 to verse 19. That is going to be our section for this sermon and for the next sermon. When we think about the importance of being a responsible citizen, we stress that as a society. As a society, we, we stress the idea of being responsible, responsible for your actions, responsible for others. We talk about being a responsible father and a responsible mother. Be a responsible child or employer or employee. Be a responsible teacher, student. Whatever the role and the function you have in society, we talk about the idea of responsibility. Taking ownership of and responsibility for the roles you have in life. In, in the society. We also think of responsibility as, we define it as doing the right thing. You want to be a person of integrity, a, a person who's dedicated, a person who has um, intellect and has abilities, and a person who can endure through the hardness of life and the hard and difficult situations of life that encompass everybody, that everybody faces, no matter who you are and, and where you live on the planet, on the globe. We stress the idea of responsibility. We stress the idea of, of, of being responsible and doing that which is needed. Why do we stress this? Why do we make, why do we make an issue over this? Well, we got to get the task done. We may have a responsibility. A student has to study for an exam and they got to get the exam done. And the teacher has the responsibility of preparing the curriculum so that the students can learn. The employer needs to make sure that the, the company can manage itself and that it can stay afloat and that it can benefit the employees who make sure that it does stay afloat and that it's, that the business stays in business so that People can earn money and earn a living. We thought it, we, we stress in, uh, responsibility because of people are depending upon you. You can't let the work be undone. You got to get it done. Otherwise, if you're not responsible, then there are consequences. Consequences. Consequences for a failure to act. Consequences for a failure to accomplish the deed that needs to be done. But what if I told you that there is a much bigger issue that you need to think about? A much bigger issue that you need to be faced with in regards to personal responsibility. And it has nothing to do with your job, per se. It has nothing to do with, with, with the areas of life that we normally attach to responsibility, even though, yes, those areas are important to deal with. They're part of our life. But there's a deeper issue, a bigger issue that we must face the music on that we must be responsible about, and that is accountability to God in regards to our sin. We must be responsible in that area. That is crucial. That is key. There are free, there are, you could bullet down to three fundamental truth claims. God created the world. Humanity has sinned against God. And God sends His Son, Jesus, into this world to redeem people from their sin. That is the overarching story of Scripture. And as we have seen already in our study of Genesis... God has created this world and created mankind, humanity, male and female, and placed them in His creation, and it's all beautiful. But mankind sins against God and destroys the whole thing. That's what we have seen. Now, we could take these three fundamental truths and expand upon them, 
But these are truths that must be affirmed. God creates the world. God creates the heavens and the earth. Humanity, whom God had created, sins against Him. And all the repercussions and ramifications of all of that are upon mankind because mankind is accountable to God. And God in His grace and in His mercy sends His Son into this world to pay the penalty of sin, your sin, my sin, pays the penalty of sin upon the cross, upon Himself, rises again from the dead. He is enthroned. He is exalted. He is over all. And we owe Him our allegiance. Each of us has a spiritual debt or a sinful debt. We are in need of Him. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. We cannot fix our own problems. And we must cry out to Him. We, every person has to affirm that. Sadly, many reject either some of those or all three. There are many people who will tell you that there is no God. There's no God who ever created anything, brought us into existence. There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as heaven. There's no such thing as hell. So there's no God to be accountable to. That's the worldview of many. Others may not take it that far and may sense in their conscience that there is a higher being or a higher power. They, they, they don't really think about it too much and, and they still are a slave to their sin. As the scriptures say, every human being is a slave to sin. But they may think that there's a God or some higher being, but they, they really don't, they can't put their finger on it and, and so they, they really don't think about it too much. They don't worry about it too much and practically speaking, they just live their life. There may be others who would say, well, no, there is a God and um, the, even the God of the Bible and, um, but, but, um, but I still want to live my way. See, it doesn't matter if you reject all three fundamental truths of Scripture are one of the three. These are fundamental truths. You, you cannot reject any of them in any form or fashion. Truth is truth. But sadly, many want to reject. Here's an example of it. Here's what one person has said. I have realized that sin is subjective. What I see as sin and what my parents see as sin is so different. For example, I'm polymorous. Polyamorous. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I believe God is polyamorous. Why would they limit us to one mate when the church preaches that God loves us the same but equally, individually, and quote, as a body? My parents slash church would see this as adultery. Is it adultery when everyone involved knows and consents? See, sin to this person is a construct made up by the church to instill fear and control. Here's their view. Be free. Live life as God intended to the fullest. Love your woman. Move in with her. Don't be fearful for what hasn't come or probably won't. Don't think about judgment, they're saying. People keep telling you that there's judgment for sin. Don't think about that. It's not going to come. Just live. Embrace that which you have been told is wrong. And you will learn to differentiate between what is beneficial and what is not. You see, sin, they say, is something, just simply something used to manipulate people into religion. 
Here are some people who will deny the existence of sin. There's no such thing as sin. They reject it wholesale. They don't fear God. They don't fear God's judgment. They deny it all. And for those who do say there is sin, for those who would preach that there is God who created the world and that humanity sinned and that God has sent His Son into this world to die on a cross and rise again to pay the penalty of sin and that the gospel can go forth, they would say it's just some kind of construct some invention of mankind just to intimidate you. Think about the people living before the flood. Think about them. Everyone living before the flood, they don't want to consider the consequences of their sin. They don't want to consider the ramifications for their sin. You would have some exceptions, Adam and Eve, some in the line of Seth, Noah, as we will see. They would listen to what God says. They would realize their sinfulness. They would realize that God did create the world, that God has promised provide a redeemer but many during the time of Noah would reject God reject his revelation sin in the heart would lead to violence and then more violence it wouldn't stop at all never abating just continuing and continuing and continuing and as we will see once we get to chapter 6 7 8 and 9 God sends a worldwide flood to judge them all There are consequences to sin. Remember, we defined sin last time in our last sermon as trying to live autonomously from God, trying to live independently from God. It's the idea, it's the the notion that you can be independent from the one who made you and that there's no accountability to the one who made you, to the one who created you, to the one who brought you into this world. That's the essence of what sin is. It manifests itself in different ways, in rebellion and and rebellious ways. But at the heart of it all, it is trying to think that you are better than God. Think about the time of Moses. The people of Israel consistently sinning, constantly sinning. They would reject God's law, even though God's law was revealed to them, gave them directions, gave them the stipulations, helped them to understand God's heart, God's character, God's nature. They would reject it wholesale. They would literally revolt against God time after time and throughout their history, throughout the the history of the nation of Israel. Look at the period of the judges. Look at the period of the divided kingdom. You would see that there is consistently uh, rebellion in the heart, sin in the heart, and it manifests itself in many different ways. And consequences would come. God would send judgment both groups, the group of people living before the flood and the group and the people living after during the time of Moses, all of them would have to face the consequences of their sin. For Noah's generation, everybody was wiped out in a worldwide flood. For the period time of Moses, that generation was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Except for Joseph and Caleb. And after Adam and Eve sinned, they're going to have to face their consequences. That's what we're going to see here in our text, in our sermon today. They're going to have to face the consequences of their sin. They're going to have to face it head on. This is something 
they will not like to do. It's going to be very uncomfortable, but it's very much needed. Life and death is in the balance here. They have sinned against God. We saw this in our last sermon as we looked at the first seven verses of Genesis 3. Life and death, their life and death, is in the balance. Let me ask the question. Do you realize that sinning against God has consequences with it? Do you consider the implications of your personal sin? Do you consider it? What it means to not deal with sin and you let it continue in your your life? You let it grow? You let it fester? You let it continue on? Do you realize the eternal impact upon your very soul if you do not address the internal sin problem in your heart? What we're going to see as we continue our study in Genesis 3 And it's going to take two sermons to look at this. Starting at verse 8, working all the way down to verse 19, we're going to see that sin brings with it a full set of consequences. And what that's going to do, it's going to cause us to face in this life, right here, right now, and in the eternity to come, We're going to have to deal with the consequences that happen now and that can happen in the future and throughout all eternity if we do not address the sin issue. It's right here on the pages of Genesis. You don't need to get to the New Testament for sin to be addressed. It is right here, right now. Let me read these verses to you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to verse 19. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, Well, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Adam and Eve had failed the test of loyalty. The test of loyalty was presented in Genesis chapter 2. They had failed that. They allowed Satan to tempt them to sin against God. They were willing to listen to Satan's temptation. And they they disobeyed God clearly. And now it's time to face the ramifications of it, of that choice, of those actions. It's time to face the consequences. It's time to face the music. And what the text presents to us, these verses that I've read to you, 
They take us to the next step of, the, of this bad and tragic situation. You see that they sin, verses 1 to 7. Well, what's the results of that? What's the consequences of that? See, the world would try to tell you there's no consequences. There's not even a, there's not even a thing called sin. Sin doesn't exist. It's just a construct of your imagination. You've allowed people, church-going people, to create the construct of sin. Sin is not, it's just, it's just a figment of their imagination. Why buy into the idea? To make you feel guilty? Why feel guilty? There is no God. There is no accountability to God. Just eat, drink, and be merry. Live your life, you know? Hey, if everybody wants to do it, just do it. Have fun with it. But the Bible speaks totally against that and says, no. There are severe consequences that everyone has to face. And the text literally gives us two. Gives us two main consequences. And they're multifaceted, but two consequences. And we're going to look at the first one today in this sermon. We'll look at the second one in the next sermon. Consequence number one. You know what happens? Now, this this should be a no-brainer. This should be a logical deduction or a logical conclusion, really, of, of, of sin entering into the world. If Adam and Eve are walking with God in the cool of the day and enjoying a relationship with Him, what do you think sin does? It breaks it. There is a broken relationship with God, and that is described in verses 8 through verse 13. You see that put on display. There's a broken relationship with God. God is the creator. God is their sustainer. God is their provider. And God created them, brought man and woman into this world to relate to each other, but to also ultimately relate to Him, to live in fellowship with Him. That's what heaven's going to be like. Heaven is a restored relationship because here it has been broken. That's the first consequence. The story picks up in verse 8, and what you see here is God comes to Adam and Eve to confront them with their sin. It says, when the cool evening breezes were blowing. That means later that day. God gives Adam and Eve a period of time between the time they physically sin, but when they eat the, the fruit, And the time in which he confronts them. It's now the evening. The evening breezes were blowing. And the man and his wife heard the Lord God. Those terms and titles used for Lord and God is God is is Elohim. Lord is is Yahweh. It's the covenant making almighty power of God. The creator of the universe is walking about in the garden. They heard him walking about in the garden. This would be typical of what God would do. God would be able to appear to them and converse with them. And they knew that there is a creator. They cannot deny that God created them. They cannot deny these fundamental truths. No way can they deny it. They know they've sinned. It's it's painted right on their face. They know that they have done wrong, that they have violated God's test of loyalty. They have clearly denied God's word. They have acted independently of God. They they have sinned. And here comes God to confront them. It says, though, when they hear, I think it's when they're hearing, when they're hearing the steps, when they're hearing the Lord God walking, The accountability is becoming fresh in their mind. It's starting to hit them like a ton of bricks. And what do they do? What you see here is a series of responses. And these responses from verse 8 to verse 13 show you the broken relationship. You see the broken relationship put on display by the responses of Adam and Eve. 
What do they do? Hearing the, 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 the walking of the Lord God in the garden. What do they do? They hid. They tried to hide, hid from the Lord God among the trees. They're trying to hide. They run away and hide. They're trying to run away from his sight. It's the idea. They think that they can hide from God. They think they can escape the Lord's presence. It's actually futile. God is God. Here is the creator of the universe. He made those trees. He, he made them. He's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. But in their sin, they forget that theology, you see. They forget those truths, and they think that they can hide away. They think that they can find a place where the Lord God would not see them. That's why they go to the trees. They have to go where they can. They're limited in what they're able to do. You see, humans are not God. Adam and Eve cannot just snap their finger and make things go away. They don't have any kind of power like that. They're not God. They're limited in their abilities. They are human, weak, frail, especially now since sin has entered into the world. They think that they can hide away. They think they can escape God. But who created the trees? God did. Who created them? God did. They've already tried and attempted to cover up their sin, right? When they, Back into the end of verse 7, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves to, because they felt shame. The shame had already come about. See, God made them. He made their... Physically, emotionally, spiritually, God gave them a conscience. God knows how they think. God is beyond them. God is uh, God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. And the, and Satan's lie was to convince them that they could be like God, that they could be at the same level as God, and that was a lie straight from the pit of hell. Straight from Satan's mouth. And they bought into it. They bought into the idea. See, there was no way for them to remove their guilt. See, emotionally they're feeling the guilt. God created the emotions in their conscience so that they would feel it. So that they would sense it. So that they would realize it. But they're not wanting to own up to it, are they? They're trying to hide. That is their first human response. One sin begets another. They're they're trying to hide away from their accountability to God. They're thinking that maybe they know they're accountable to Him, but they're thinking just maybe, just maybe, just maybe we can can walk away. We We can change this deal. We can fix this deal. But there's no fixing it. And so God calls out to them, In verse 9, then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? It could be that the man and the woman separate themselves, trying to hide under trees, and and, and the, the Lord goes after the man first. He's going after Adam, calling to the man. And God's not doing this just for the sake I want information. He's, he's, he's asking to get a response. He's probing. He's asking to probe Adam To own up to his sin. To own up to what has happened here. See, they they were trying to hide. And so that response, hiding, leads to the second response. He's not going to stay quiet. He's going to have to respond. When God calls, he's going to have to respond. And so he replies, verse 10, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. He reiterates what he had done, his first response. And why? Because he says, I was afraid because I was naked. The first response led to the second response. He hid because of fear. What was he fearing? Why was he afraid? It says here, because I was naked. 
What does that mean? It's Adam's way of saying, I realized that I'm afraid of your judgment. Sin hit him like a ton of bricks. Him committing sin hit him like a ton of bricks. He knew that he had failed God. He had failed the test of loyalty. He had violated the clear teaching of God's word. And he needed to own up to it. And that's what he didn't want to do. He feared the, the repercussions. He didn't know what God would do. He was exposed. That's the idea of being naked. I'm exposed to you. I, I, something's wrong with me now. I didn't know this would happen. And so he hid because of fear. And in, in, in the way he's making the statement, he's trying to self-justify or trying to shift the focus. He's trying to rationalize it. It's like him saying, God, if you had not shown up, I'd still be okay. No, you wouldn't. God, you had to show up in the garden right now. You're, you're making this worse for me. You're triggering me. You're triggering me right now. You're triggering my fear, my anxiety, my worry. Look at God. If you would just not show up, I'd be okay. But that's not... You're not okay. You don't need God showing up to... You, you, what are you going to do? Deny it? You're going to deny your sin? That's the idea of hiding. You're trying to live in denial. God shows up to Adam to confront him. And that's the point of it. God is going to confront you with your sin. You can't hide from God. You can try to rationalize it away. You can try to justify it away, self-justify it, do whatever you want to do, but you can't get rid of it. That's the point. It's like Adam saying, Lord, your presence near me, it frightens me. I wish you would just not be here. I wish you would just go away. If you just go away and not confront me, everything would be okay. But that's not reality. Even if God never confronted him, he would still be sinful. And that's the danger of apostasy. When God says, you know what? You are a sinner. You are lost. You are dying. You're on your way to hell. And guess what? No more am I going to confront you. No more am I going to speak to you. No more am I going to point out your sinfulness. I'm not going to send anybody to tell you. I'm not going to deal with you. I'm going to let you go. That's the danger of apostasy. When somebody crosses the line, God lets them go. There is no place where they can come to the point of repenting. Because they've denied the Lord and denied His Word for the final time. Unbelievable, but that's the way of the Word. That's the, what the Word of God says. That's another sermon for another day. I could go on for hours about that one. See, Adam is trying to hide. Because of fear. And in a sense, he's kind of... He's realizing his con the consequences. He's, he's feeling it at an emotional level. There's a lot happening, on here, happening here emotionally inside of Adam. But on the one hand, too, he's trying to... He's trying to cast blame on God. God, you made it like this! Well, God asks, who told you that you were naked? Hmm? It's interesting, the question. Because God had not told him that explicitly. The only thing God had said is, where are you? How did he get to that place? How did Adam get to the place? That's what God is asking. And what God's asking is, how do you know that things are no longer good between you and I? Hmm? How do you know that now? What circumstances took place? You see the word, um, who told you that you were naked? That's singular. So he's talking directly to Adam. 
How, what happened? What event took place? And God knows, but he's probing, you see. It's masterful how God talks here. You see, God built into the person. He built in. It's a part of our DNA. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of how God fashioned us. Here's the deal. See, all your evolutionists believe there's no God. Okay, we just evolved. We're self-made creatures. We're, we've evolved from the ape or the slime pit or whatever. So there's no God who created us, who made us, who fashioned us. No, not in their evolutionary worldview. Okay, so if, if there's no God, then how, how can you explain the functionality of our brain, the functionality of our body, all of the, all of the emotions that we feel as a human being? How, how do you explain it? Well, that's what the philosophers and the psychologists and everybody's trying to figure out and, and the scientists, and they're trying to put it all together and they're trying to, they're trying to figure out why we are, what makes us tick as human beings. How do we function as human beings in this world? Because their premise is there is no God. And so they're trying to understand the human psyche, the human condition, with apart from God being in the picture. Okay? Well, the reality is God created us. God made us. The Bible expresses it. If you, if you factor God into everything, if you factor the truth of Scripture into it, then things begin to make sense. We have complexity. We have intellect. We have rationality. Why? Because we're created in the image of God. No animal, no creature uh, uh, that God created was like that. We're unique in that way. And so God is dealing with Adam from that perspective of him having rationality, intelligence. God inbred it into him, installed it into him. It was already a part of the, of the creation of Adam. And so, Adam, how do you know? Who told you? It was his own conscience that told him. The mechanism kicked into gear. To, re to tell him that things are not good between God and him. The circumstances was that he chose to eat, him and Eve chose to eat from that tree and violate the test of loyalty. It's as though God is saying, Adam, do you remember the test of loyalty? Notice what he says in verse 11. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? See, God already knows that that's what they've done. But he's asking and probing him to engage him because what has happened? The relationship that they had has now been affected by what they have done. Not what God has done but by what they have done. Their relationship with God is broken because of them. See, God is the loving Father. Now He's seeking the wayward children through means of interrogation, asking probing questions. Rather than pounding on them and, and just wiping them out, He's allowing them the opportunity to admit their sinfulness. That's what he's doing here. He's giving Adam the opportunity to admit his sinfulness, to admit that he is a sinner. Have you eaten from that tree? Whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? need to say yes, Adam. You need to say yes. God's probing even deeper. If you violated my clear command, you know what this is? Well, that question, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? You know what that is? That's accountability in your face. That's what God's doing. He's placing the accountability right in front of them. That's a good thing. I know it's uncomfortable. You don't want to deal with it. You think Adam wants to deal with this right now? No, he'd probably go, he'd probably rather go have a cup of coffee and let's just powwow or something. Let's just 
Walk away, God. I just need, I need a moment. I need you just to go away. I don't need to deal with this right now. I need some me time, God. God's not going to let him have it. God's going to probe him, probe him, probe him. Yes, in a very loving way, but he's not going to allow him to feel comfortable in his sin. That's what he's not going to allow him to do. This is accountability in your face. See, being physically naked in front of God now to Adam is something that he felt shame over. And what Adam's realizing is that he can't hide from God. He can't elude God. And he may have wanted to aspire for God-likeness like Eve did, but now he's not, he's not God-like. Uh, no way. He, all he is now is standing in front of his Creator, the true God of heaven, the one who brought him into this world, and he's standing in front of him, shame-faced, culprit, without a word to his defense. And even when God probes him, the answer to the question at the end of verse 11 is, yes, Lord, I have sinned. That would be what Jesus would say in the Beatitudes is seeing your spiritual poverty, realizing that you are impure and need to be cleansed in your heart. That's what that is right there. All you have to say, Adam, is yes, I have sinned, but he doesn't want to admit it. Everything in him is fighting against it. The guilt is there. The shame is there. The desire to hide from God is there. The, the, but there's, there's, oh, I just don't want that accountability in my face. Get it away from me. Maybe it'll just go away. I'm going to be in denial. God, talk to the hand. I'm not listening. You know, any rationale that you want to put spin on it, anything that Adam wants to do to try to wiggle his way out of this, that is what's happening here. He's not replying the way he needs to reply. Because what does he do? What reply does he give? Well, this takes us to response number three. The man replied, instead of owning up to it and saying, Lord, I have sinned against you, like the, like the public and the tax collector who comes to the temple and prays to God, doesn't even lift up his face, and he says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Adam doesn't do that. Not here. Instead of owning up to it, he blame shifts. He's still seeking further self-justification. I'm not culpable of my sinful actions. I, 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 you know, he's trying to wiggle his way out of it. And so he passes the buck to somebody else. That's an idiomatic expression, but that's what he does here. He doesn't want to believe that he's responsible for his personal sin. So what does he say? It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate. It's just like, it's the same thing as um, when Moses confronts Aaron. Well, you know, we just threw in the gold and look what came out. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> the pattern keeps repeating itself. How many times have we done this? We don't want to admit we're the rich. See, this is where you, it, Jesus presents it very well. You have to see your spiritual poverty, that you're poor in spirit, that you are you have a spiritual sin debt. And you have nothing to commend yourself to God. Just like Adam, we've eaten from that fruit. Time and time again. And what we deserve is God's judgment. Death. That's what, we, that's what we deserve. And God lovingly confronts us. Lovingly probes us. Lovingly convicts us. 
It's harsh. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to deal with it. And it's the man, Adam, blame shifting. And saying, it's the woman you gave me. When he says this, he, it says, though, he's saying the woman, Eve. That's eventually what her name will be. Um, Adam names his wife Eve, verse 20. When he says the woman, he's the woman is described as the cause of his sin, of him falling into sin. But it's more indirect. He's really directly blaming God. It's the woman you gave me. Instead of owning up to his sin, he's blame shifting, blame shifting it direct and indirect. God, you are the cause of my sin. No, he's not. And if you had not given me this woman, I'd be okay. That's what he, that's what that's what we do. See, you want to you want you want to you want to understand the nature of the broken relationship between us and God. It's because just look at the responses of Adam. We do the same thing. We're not immune to this. That's why this is here to be a to help us to see this plays out every day. This is the pattern. You got to agree with me. You got to agree with the Bible. He's blame shifting. God, you are the problem by imputation, asserting that it was God who set her by his side. God, if you had not put her by my side, I wouldn't be in this mess. He's finding fault with God's, with God's work, with God's work of creation. And him doing this is just further example, further realization of the reality of sin in the heart of Adam. Instead of admitting it, he wants the blame shift. It's his way of trying to have non-responsibility, to assert non-responsibility, that I am not responsible for my sin. If you hadn't have done what you did and brought this woman into my life, I would be fine. <laughs> you don't get it, Adam. You would have chosen to sin. You can try to blame shift and put the blame on somebody else. But at the end of the day, you're responsible. Well, God's going to come back and address the man. That's going to be from verse 17 to verse 19. But instead of doing it right now, at this point, God goes to the woman. What have you done? He, maybe the woman will answer, I've sinned against you. Maybe the woman will answer correctly. She's getting the same question to her that Adam got from God. And she knows it. She's feeling the same guilt. She's hiding because of fear. I mean, the shame is there. She's feeling emotionally everything Adam's feeling. It's all the same because they both have clearly sinned against God and, and, and God is confronting them. And again, be thankful that God is confronting them. God is pointing out their sin. He, he wants them to admit it. He wants them to come to the terms of it. What have you done? What does she do? She does the same thing, blame shift. She can't say it was the man 
He's already passed the buck to her. She's going to pass it over to, to the serpent. The serpent deceived me. She replied, that's why I ate it. Oh, oh, this is the devil made me do it. A la Flip Wilson. What God does is, is confront her directly. It is true that the woman gave the fruit to Adam, to the man. But that doesn't absolve Adam of guilt. There's a lot of guilt to go around here. Adam is full of guilt. So is the woman. Adam chose to eat from that tree. No matter what the rationale he convinced himself of, the woman was willing to eat from that tree. She already had doubts in her mind even before Satan ever talked to her. We saw that back in her response. In verse 3, to Satan. Satan didn't make her sin. He greased the slide. He tempted her. But it's not his fault. Not for her sin. She, she needs to own up to personal responsibility and for, for her actions. She ate from that tree. Remember verse 6, she's convinced by everything. She saw that the tree was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. Everything about that tree thought, this is it. I need this. This is what I got to do. I have to go this direction. I have to do this sin. I don't care what God has said. Satan tells me I won't die. I'm going to believe that lie. I'm going to believe the lie that I'll be just like God and I'm going to have power and I'm going to be supreme and I'm going to be the top person in the room. But she ate it. She chose to. And God demands from her And confronts her about her sin, about her actions. And he has a right to do it. He's God. See, when he asks the question, what have you done? It points to the enormity of the misdeed and her evasion of responsibility It's interesting that she's willing to throw away the relationship she has with the Lord, but this is what she's desiring to do. By blame shifting, it's as though she's dumping the truth for the sake of personal appeasement. That's, that's what we do. The, the Bible confronts us with our sin, confronts us with the reality of our sinful heart, paints the picture of it, gives us the display of it. And what do we do? We take, we take the Bible and say, it's not the Word of God. There is no God. Practically speaking, doesn't matter what you, what you may say, people who remain in their sin are practically atheists. They don't want to consider that God is going to confront them with their sinfulness. They don't want to deal with it. They're trying to hide from it. They're trying to blame shift. It's, it was my inner child. I need to get in touch with my inner child. Or my father made me do it. And, and, and my parents are my problem. And you know they're blame shifting. Everybody wants to blame shift. Man can never bring a good case into God's presence to justify their sinfulness. As long as their works are being considered, and that's how God judges. He judges based on the deeds done, the evidence. The deeds done show either the heart is righteous, has been transformed by the grace of God, or it's still remaining in its sinfulness. That's what you see here. You see the broken relationship? that Adam and Eve now have with God? I hope you do. It's pretty clear. And we have the same kind of broken relationship between us and God. And how are we to deal with that? 
You can't hide it away. You can't shrug it under a carpet. You can't shrug it under a rug. You can't, uh, you can't just throw it away. You can't just try to, oh, 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 I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear you. I, I'm not, I'm, I, 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 I don't want to deal with this. No, you got to deal with it. You got to face it. You got to confront it. Gotta... God is confronting you with your sin because you're accountable to him and you must acknowledge it. You must see the reality of it. And he offers a path for forgiveness through his, the death and resurrection of his son. And you cry out to Him for mercy. You come to Him for salvation. That's what you do. That's what you do. It's the only way to salvation. The next consequence, which starts in verse 14, going to verse 19, we'll look at that next time. Not only is there a broken relationship with God, but there's separation from God. And they both are like two sides of the same coin. This is the passage where God brings the curses upon the serpent, upon the woman, and upon the man. And we'll look at that in the next sermon. The consequences of sin is real. The consequences of sin are very real. No matter how much you might want to, whatever you feel about it, might want to try to think there are none. Some of the consequences to sin are temporal, meaning just they're in this life, but they happen in this life. That you There's physical ramifications that take place in this life. You see that in the scriptures where, where God would wipe out the entire world, physically speaking, because of their sin. It happens in this life. It also affects eternity. Those people before the flood who get wiped away, wiped off the face of the earth in the worldwide flood, they... Their physical life comes to an end and they immediately go into the place of hell, which is a separation from God. All sin, though, affects eternally. And you feel these consequences. At least you should. Broken relationship with God. Separation from God. I hope you don't want your... If you have a broken relationship with God because of your sin, it's my hope that you would seek the Lord while He may be found. Are you willing to come to God? Repent from your sin? Place your full heart faith in Him? Have Him change your life? Do you know the Lord in a salvation way? Committing your life to Him? Committing to obeying His Word? Trusting in Him? Acknowledging Him? Confessing Him? Confessing Him to others? Confessing Him before men? You need to commit to believing in Him owning up to your sin, commit to these fundamental foundational truths that Scripture tells us repeatedly about. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, the Lord gives the invitation. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? That Those questions are figurative expressions that deal with, it's like this. Why keep denying the reality of your sin? Why try figuring it all out on your own? Why try hiding away from me, denying accountability to me, thinking you can fix your own life your own way. Why are you trying to live independently of from me? Be thirsty. Hunger and thirst 
for God's righteousness. He says, listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. So he's using this figure of figurative expressions of eating and drinking to talk about taking in who the Lord is, having the relationship, the broken relationship restored, having your eternal destiny brought back together where it should be. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Same chapter, verse 6. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. The, the idea of changing your ways is the ways of the wicked is to hide from sin, to, to, uh, to, 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 to try to deny responsibility, deny accountability, deny that, that even judgment exists. That's the wickedness. It needs to be banished. Let them turn to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. Wow. <laughs> the consequences of sin are real. But the hope in Christ the hope in Him for salvation is because, see, you sin, you die. But Christ came to pay that death for you, to die that spiritual death for you, so to speak, to pay the consequences of your spiritual death. He was sinless. He never sinned. Holy and righteous and true. And He became sin for us, the text says. He came to die, to take our place as our substitute and offer us forgiveness, hope, a restored relationship with Him because of what He has done. Offers us grace, offers us mercy. But you have to Repent from sin. And repenting from sin means you don't hide from Him, try to self-justify, try to rationalize your sin away. No, you admit it. You come to terms with it. You see your sin for what it is and you see the horror of it and the, and the, and the tragedy of it and the, the wickedness of it and you turn from that to the Lord. That, that is the gospel in Genesis. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are, you're so true. Your word is so true. Your word is fixed. And Lord, you do confront us in our sinfulness. You probe us. Lovingly probe us. Lovingly confront us. Lord, you lead and guide and direct. Lord, for those who would say that you don't exist, they are the fools. Because it's clear that you do. It's clear that you are Lord in the universe. And one day, those of us who know you those of us whose lives have been changed, we're going to see you face to face. Lord, I pray for anyone listening to, to this message today, to your word being preached, to your word being proclaimed. If they do not truly know you, if they've never repented from their sin, Lord, probe them, confront them, show them their sinfulness. Make their lives uncomfortable. Bring them to yourself. It's all in your power. It's all in your will. Lord, may you receive all the praise and all the glory now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So share this message with others. Um, the Sunday series going through Genesis. 
and we're going to continue to do that each week and uh, on Sundays. And um, may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you and be acquainting yourself with the book of Genesis. Uh, I also have been doing an inductive journey of Genesis. I'm building these sermons from what I have learned going through uh, the chapters in Genesis and the verses in Genesis, just going verse by verse through the text. And it's powerful, powerful truth that we all must know. May the Lord continue to bless you, and we'll see you next time.